wait. You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hey everybody, welcome to TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, your TV Guidance Counselor. This is the show where each and every week I welcome an interesting person onto the show. They pick an old TV guide from my vast archives. I scan it for them, send them a PDF, they go through the week and pick what they'd watch, and then we sit down and talk about it. Uh, I've been doing it about eight years. I am currently an on hiatus stand-up comedian, but uh, I am now fully vaccinated, so hopefully uh, I will be out of my house at some point after the last whatever how many months i don't know 15 20 years uh but that is the show and it is a lot of fun and this week's episode is no exception my guest this week you probably best know as the drummer and lyricist for the band less than jake he is Vinny fiorello uh he has a new band out right now and does a ton of stuff like this i'm not I, i'm not uh, being facetious when i say he's a renaissance man uh but Vinny has a, a book out called 619 it's a, sort of a short story book uh he's got a new band called the inevitables uh uh, he's got a toy company, record label, guy does everything, uh, which makes me feel horribly inadequate, but that's fine. Most things do. Uh, but I had a great chance talking to a great chance. I had a great chance to talk to him and I took it and then we had a great time. <laughs> What am I talking about? I am like a, just a mush mouth this week. Uh, I've also had way too much caffeine today, but anyway, and uh, I want to thank my friend Peter for, for hooking up a Vinny with the show or hooking me up with Vinny for the show. You know, I'm going to go take a nap while you listen to this episode. Uh, it's probably best, but I think you'll enjoy it very much. So please sit back, relax and enjoy this week's episode of TV guidance counselor with my guest, Vinny Fiorello. TV is my friend and has been always there for me in time of need. Vinny, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's full tilt summer in Gainesville, Florida right now, so I'm 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 there. I'm there for it. You could tell by my uh, woolly hat. That <laughs> woolly hat and a beard is how you do summer in Gainesville. Yeah. <laughs> isn't it always the air condition? So. Isn't it always summer down there? You know what you would think so, right? But uh, we're, we we have a good solid January of winter here. Okay. <laughs> Everything else is, uh, you know, spring and then summer. Because you, uh, and interestingly enough, the, the TV guide we picked here is June 15th to the 21st, 1985. And I think you were, were you still living in Jersey at this time? I, I most definitely was living in Jersey at this time. So full, a full uh, 15 year old. Vincent Fiorello in Woodward, <laughs> New Jersey. I've, I've been there. Where's Woodward? Wood, Woodbridge. Oh, Woodbridge. It's, it's sandwiched between uh, like Newark and uh, New York City. Okay. So you could get into the city relatively ten, 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 min, 10 minutes by train. Oh, all right. So it wasn't in the middle of nowhere in New Jersey. You, were st- you could go into Manhattan. I, I could. I could could and i did i bought fireworks in chinatown when <laughs> i got my first fake id you know i got solicited uh outside of port authority all the all the the, the, new the jersey. classic new york new jersey yeah, yeah. <laughs> the classic tri-state experiences yeah the, the, the coming of age of new jerseyites going to new york city and and doing all those things yeah i mean chinatown for me here in boston was just going and buying exotic weaponry Oh yeah, <laughs> like, I, was, I was there as well. Yeah, like weird gauntlets with knives on them, and like right, things I'm, you could throw. Yeah, and Chinese right. stars throwing oh, yeah. knives, nunchakus, whatever yep. it is. Right. Yep, it was just an arsenal because teenagers need uh, an Eastern arsenal. That's really what was required. You, you know, it's funny because you know what we're about to talk about, and it brought me at, as I was looking at the list and looking through the TV guide. Uh, I remember a show that got me started in like sort of weaponry and trying to make my own like improvised weapons in the in the basement. There was a, a show with Lee Van Cleef. It was called the Master. The Master. Yep. And man, that 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 got me like sort of like every like sort of a uh, uh, fiber of my being. It, it got me right there. I was like, I got to have Chinese stars. I have to go to karate. I have to learn how to make smoke bombs out of like other stuff in the basement. I have to like figure out improvised weapons. So yeah, like, and those climbing claws. Yeah, it, it wasn't. It wasn't um, 
playing during this time. So. Yeah, it was a one season show. It was on eighty two to eighty three. It was um, it was Lee Van Cleef and Vince Van Patten. I think it was Vince yeah. Van Patten. Mm-hmm. Um, it might have been a different Van Patten. I get them confused. <laughs> um, but the Ninja was actually this guy Show Kashugi, who was. Uh, in the um, in all the ninja movies that Canon Pictures made, so like Ninja One, Ninja Two, even Ninja Three, the Domination, which is a, a de- demonic possession disco dance movie, he's also in. Um, so he <laughs> doubled Lee Van Cleef in The Master, and he also played the villain in The Master. <laughs> so there's he also he also was uh, an author on Weapon Tree Instruction, yes. which I owned. So yes. as a as a teenager. And he is like the individual responsible for popularizing the concept of ninjas. I, it, I agree 100 percent Which is like crazy. I said, like I said, that watching that Friday night, it's like eight or nine, I forget what it was, but man, that got that got me going. It 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 every fiber of myself at that time, I was 13 to 12 and 13. I was there, man. I was there for it. And so there for it. Oh yeah. There's, there's actually a great Blu-ray box set of all the episodes. That's super cheap. Uh, and I highly recommend getting, cause they're like remastered and look really nice, but there's a ton of guest stars on that show that went on to be famous. Like Demi Moore's in the first episode. Um, it's crazy to see all these people in that show who went on Helen Hunt's in one. Uh, okay. yeah, but I love that show as well. And, uh, it, it got re-released as movies in Europe. Uh, under the names <laughs> Master Ninja. So they'd edit two episodes together and it was a movie that played in theaters. And Mystery Science Theater 3000 actually did two of the movie versions. So they did Master Ninja wow. and Master Ninja 2. Um, yeah, but I, I think when we grew up too, just that was, we were the first uh, generation of white kids that really got slapped with martial arts. Like that was the coolest thing. You know You know what? We, we, were, we, we were the, the sort of, the the past that point it was like okay you have like the bruce lee that was the first wave right yep. where people were like oh my god we're gonna karate jikando taekwondo whatever it is but we were the we were that second generation that second wave of it's the karate kid it's yeah. the master it's the whatever they had a ton of shows at that time that would you know always push the the sort of martial arts thing to it and we were we were there that was the second wave of wow i i want to go to lessons and i want to oh yeah find weapon tree and and do all these (laughs) things i want to get a black eye with a a nunchaku as i try (laughs) to figure it out and i I want to injure myself is basically i'm I'm gonna have partial blindness in my left eye for the for like two years by doing that but worth it but worth it yeah it's funny how there are I always look at like whatever the weird trend is and, and like every suburban town has in a strip mall. And it's odd to think of a time when there wasn't at least one karate school in every single suburban town, Absolutely, and it's, it, you know, and now it's, and then it was like a frozen yogurt place. And then it was like, now it's a, probably a vape store. Uh, <laughs> right. And med- medical marijuana. Yeah. Just goes through all, marijuana. all the things, uh, may have been a, um, a, a zone diet location or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this was, and this was like the, the 85 is my favorite year of movies, but also like just the huge year of action TV shows. Yeah. Like that's what we were getting was action in general. I mean, we're talking a team MacGyver Magnum, like all of the eighties action shows. This was like the pinnacle. You know what? It's you're right. And there, you mentioned a few things that, that were in there, right. That I, at that time, you know, it's, I, I read through the rules and the regulations oh, yeah. of your, of your show. Right. Thank you. And it, it's not that I, I pick things that not only would I watch now, given the opportunity, but my taste really has gone like <laughs> lateral, man. Like I would, I watched it then and I watched it now. There's yep. only one, there's actually two shows that we're going to talk about that I would never watch again. Right. But everything else, if someone said, Hey, do you want to watch three's company and be like, yeah, let's hell yeah. This. I'm dropping yeah. everything. And, I'm doing yeah, it. Okay. and we can do that. Um, so let's dive in. Then uh, there's uh, some interesting articles in this one too. Uh, and of course, always the cigarette ads, which always uh, entertain me because they're for, uh, I-, I never smoked, but these brands I've never heard of before. And I swear to God, some of these, they like never repeat the same brand twice. Like I've never <laughs> seen Barclay cigarettes uh, in my life um, or Carlton or some of the other ones here. Uh, very, very strange. Um, 
but then Virginia Slims, obviously, we've all heard of. Um, were you going to punk rock shows and stuff like that at this time, or was that later? I just started going. <clears throat> okay. So I, at, at 15, I was showing up to uh, City Gardens in uh, Jersey City. I was showing up to uh, the Sunday matinees at CBGB's, the hardcore matinees. I was going to Lemoore's in Brooklyn. Uh when I could get my brother to take me, who was four years older than me. Uh, and I saw some great shows, man. Like uh, one that right out of the, right out of the gate, uh, it was Wendy O. Williams, nice. right? From the Plasmatics. Yep. But it was Chromax opening for Wendy Jesus Williams, Christ. Right? Uh, So it was that. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those moments where I was finding, trying to find things that I liked, Right. Yeah, and trying to find my my spot in the world of music. My brother was really good, but I caught him like, and like the the end of like for him it was new wave and and punk, but he started to wane into metal, right? Yeah. So so as I was getting the punk, I was diving in more, and then I got into thrash. So like I got into like Slayer, Haunting the Chapel, and I got into you know, early, early Metallica and armored Saint and anthrax Exodus anthrax. Yeah. And there was uh, two really, really good record stores that were close by in Jersey. And that was vintage vinyl and vintage vinyl. Like at the time was a very small record store. Now it's massive, right? Uh, they, they took over a bunch uh, and then rock and roll heaven. So rock and roll heaven for me, that was the, 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 moment where they had like you can like meet and greets every like saturday afternoon and so it was anthrax one time and that was i think it was fistful metal at that time and then it was uh, among the living uh and then it was uh sod stormtroopers of death <laughs> jesus uh that i that i met and it was celtic frost and it was a bunch but i was a uh, a teenage uh, thrash meller and crossover punkers. So that's, that's how I grew up in Jersey. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's per that you've some Jersey up in the eighties really right there. Um, and all the bands too. I mean, by 85 here in Boston, all the hardcore bands have become metal bands like that SSD, how we rock record. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, you know, they were like full on metal. Um, I went the other way where I was like the, the, the mission of Burma already gothy way. Um, and, no, but that was my that was my moody uh, transgression. And then City Gardens, which there's a great documentary about if the listeners haven't watched it. But uh, my favorite fun fact about City Garden, which I'm sure you know, is that one of the doormen was John Stewart. That's great. He, I didn't still, know that. he worked it for years, for years and years and years. He worked at City Gardens. Um, so you very likely had a fake ID checked by him at some point. That That, that is <laughs> terrific to know. And, and, and I actually hope. The, the cool thing about city gardens for me, there was a, like a, a field uh, that you could like play soccer at and do whatever close by. And uh, I remember like two, four, seven spies. And I remember shades apart, a bunch like hardcore kids uh, playing soccer. And I was like, man, like, I, I could give a fuck less about sports. Like, cause I was in that world, like one foot in metal being a metal head, which is like, lethargy at its best yep. like you pride yourself on lethargy and then a punker who could care less about anything and nihilist right so when i saw like oh my god like look at the punk bands are playing sports i right. just like golf at it like come on like, that's not that's know? jock shit man for real though. yeah right. um shades apart is so great i love shades I apart. oh their new record's really good too um yeah i mean here here in boston we had the rat which I did wow. listen, Jacob, play the rat. We never played it, but I know what it is. Yeah. Um, that was like RCBGBs. I used to hang out there every weekend, but the closest we got to sports, and this is a horrifying story. So I, I, uh, I <laughs> fair warning. There was a big dumpster right next to the door, uh, which wasn't that different from the club, which was really gross. <laughs> and it, it was literally filled with rats. Like, I don't even think there was garbage in there. It was just like thousands of rats and the parking lot that that the rat was in was where people parked if they're going to like a red sox game yeah. so when a red sox game got out all the people came out to get in their cars and there's just all these like punk and hardcore kids standing around too right. and so what inevitably someone would always do is go bang on the dumpster 
and all these rats would just come running out. It's like Nosferatu, like a sea of rats just, and you'd hear all these people getting into their, just screaming. And it was, that was as close as we got to soccer. I, I'd be, I'd be screaming as well. Oh yeah. I hate it. I was so freaked out. I was like, this, what's <laughs> happening? <laughs> Let me jump on someone's roof. Uh, so let's dive in here where uh, it's summertime. So we'll probably get a lot of repeats, but also uh, no bedtime. So June 15th, 1985. Yeah, I mean, here we are. Let's let's go with. Uh, we're gonna start Saturday, right? That's yep, where yep. like it, it's at. Uh, Eight p.m. Love Boat. Yep. Uh, and Love Boat for me, uh, I, I never particularly liked the like sort of the vibe of it, but I liked the guests of it, right? And I like the fact that they had like, even though it was, hey, it's a ship, but every week had a little bit of a different, you know, that storyline and that peak and different faces. And I went. Yeah, like this is this is for me. Like it was mindless entertainment as a teenager. It wasn't that I was in love with it, but it filled on Saturday. If I was home at that time, and sometimes I would not be, but uh, Love Boat would be would be the choice. There's hands down, no doubt about it. Yeah, I always say it was it was the best value for money show because you're basically getting four shows uh, in one yeah. hour, and if you didn't like, and they were all different tones. Like there would be a comedy one, a really serious one. There'd be like one about suicide and like drug use. And then like a, a super horny one. Like it was just really weird. It, it, uh, it was, it was very weird. And I remember actually one of the, the serious ones where it was the captain's daughter was addicted to diet pills. Yes. Yes. So, like I was, you know, and I was, I was there for it, man. Like uh, you're right there. It was, if you didn't like the first part of it, just hang around for a little bit and you're going to, it was the, everything was going to change and the vibe was going to be like there. And sometimes the, the crew would get intermingled more. So it would become like the cruise deal instead of the, like the guests. And you could tell that's when sometimes like a uh, uh, Sharo, right. Would be yes. on and did have the command of like a, a, a very clear English language. And so they would have her come on and do a couple like taglines, but then it would be, a lot of other people like picking up the slack for the storyline <laughs> and, and having talked to people since doing the show, I've talked to people who, who did love boat episodes and you got to actually go on a cruise. Oh, that's awesome. So they paid you, you know, day rates, which were really good in the seventies and eighties. Mm. And you're going on a cruise for two weeks. Yeah, all, <laughs> all, the, all the cigarettes and all the Coke that you could yeah. possibly have. Yeah. Oh, um, and, and STDs too. Exactly. Them. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's a standard at the time, but you know, <laughs> that's the price you pay. Uh, this episode has uh, Dick Budkiss in it. Uh, one of my favorite former athletes turned, uh, turned actors uh, playing a, a heavyweight champ. <laughs> <laughs> who's trying to win over a woman and then james noble is in this one who is the father of a boy with a reading problem and he refuses to believe his son may be dyslexic a really light saturday night <laughs> totally totally and then doris roberts is in this one trying to set up her daughter like you're just getting so much stuff in that in that half hour um i do want to mention too that it's your move was on um which was a very short lived show. Jason Bateman's first starring role uh, after silver spoons and is a show that holds up pretty well. Like he just plays a complete asshole kid who's like a schemer and really unlikable. And people hated the show because it was weird to have an unlikable character at that time, which sounds crazy now. (laughs) Yeah. Truth on that. (laughs) Oh, I, I I never heard of that show. It's a fun show. It, it, there's a great two-parter where uh, he schemes to have this heavy metal band play at his high school, and he's he's trying to just steal the money from the high school. <laughs> so he he called. They're called the. Uh, oh my god! The damn it! I can't remember the name. It's like it's like the Lords of Chaos or some crazy like black metal know. type name. Yeah. Um, so his plan is that he's taking the money, he's pretending to be their um, their manager, and then he tells the school they all died in a in a van crash and they can't <laughs> play. So he wants the money back. Um, but then it turns out that he they if they don't play, he's going to end up going to jail or something. So he <laughs> he gets all these skeletons from the science lab. And like weekend at Bernie puppeteer is a metal act. <laughs> his pants, which is crazy. That's uh, uh, and on give me a break that night, we got a musical guest star. 
Ray Parker Jr. <laughs> oh man, I, I bet I missed. I missed it. I, I would have. I would have went over there. I mean, yep. who doesn't like a nice Ray Parker Jr. at this point? Oh yeah, eighty-five Ray Parker Jr. is at the height of his powers. Yeah. <laughs> no one knew about the lawsuit at that time. No, not at all. <laughs> Which is everyone was the- like, "This is great." If Huey Lewis was like doing a bong hit, going, "That guy's beyond." Right? <laughs> I've heard this before. Yeah, it sounds so familiar, man. <laughs> man, um, so you watched that? Then what'd you do after that? Mama's family. Oh man, I could never do it. Are you a fan? You know what? Here, here's what happened. I when I was growing up, my parents used to watch the Carol Burnett show, and one of the characters was from Vicky Lawrence, right? Uh, yeah, Vicky yep, Lawrence. Vicky and, Lawrence. Yep. Uh, what was was Mama, right? And uh, so let me give you the rundown. If Saturday night at nine p.m. that clocked in, right? Uh, my father would be in charge of the TV, right? And Mama's family would definitely be it because of the carryover of the Carol Burnett show. But I talk about like unlikable characters being like in a popular show. I mean, that that's what the main character was. You know, Mama was, you know, a terrible human being <laughs> uh, and, and flanked by idiots, right? Mm-hmm. That she would take advantage of and use as like minions. And then the nice son... Right. The one that was like uh, kind of uh, like, you know, bow down to her and, and kind of, you know, elevate her up like she would just stamp on him. You know, oh, so yeah. that nice character in that was just a buffoon. And the, the lead character uh, was Bama, who was an awful human being. So uh, <laughs> I would I, I would go with that. But it, it was so weird to me because it was. It's an old, it's a young lady dressed very unconvincingly as an old lady. Cause it came from a sketch. Yes. And for some reason, as a kid, I, even though, you know, sitcoms were artificial, I was like, this is some, this bullshit. What's happening here? This, she's not an old lady. Like for some reason it really bothered me. Yeah. And I can agree with, uh, with you on that, but you know, check it out. That was like, for me was like during this whole time, it became old people equal funny. Right. Well, so, yeah. so you had golden girls and you had a whole bunch and gone was that sort of like, if you were old, you're respected and revered and you were knowledgeable beyond everybody else. Like this time of TV, if you were old, you were like sarcastic and a wisecracker and like, you knew how to like get someone's goad and like do the whole thing. So uh, you were sort of uh, desensitized to older characters, not being so, uh oh yeah I'm I'm older so now I'm not funny and right. I'm I'm mellow so that 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 was our mama's family for sure it was kind of the cocoon syndrome where before that you'd have old people who were like the you damn kids are uh, you ruining everything and now it was like they're like wait a minute old people don't give a fuck yeah. they'll just tell you anything because they're gonna die soon so they don't care and it was like broke open this whole new realm of storytelling right. um. This one is a weird one too. Speaking, especially given what we were just talking about with punk rock, because it says uh, Mama expects to serve as technical advisor for a 1940 style fundraising dance at the high school until the kids opt for punk instead. <laughs> <laughs> this right. is the this is the punk rock episode of Mama's Family, which I have That's not awesome. seen, and now I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure YouTube has it. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, anything else on Saturday? You know what? That was it. That would be it. You know, by by ten ten thirty, I would be locked in the room, my own room, and maybe sneaking a, a, a you know half a joint out the window and uh, listening to records. You know, I by ten o'clock, no matter what, I'd be away from the TV uh, in the living room, and I would you know retreat to my bedroom to listen to records and hang out and you know do whatever. It wasn't until time. I was maybe like. Uh, 16 or 7 it was probably like a little after i was 16 i got a tv right uh before that it was just a one one tv house and it was in the living room and uh you had to fight for it right? did you guys have cable uh we did have cable okay and just one sibling just one older brother uh yeah he wasn't living with us at the time so okay. it was me my mom and dad and i would get i would get uh outvoted two, right two to one 
Yeah. So. Adults rule there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I always say one of the things I, in, when I'm being an old man, um, I complain that kids, one of the skills they've lost is the ability to make an argument for something they like. Cause those of us that had siblings in one TV, you had to like convince other people <laughs> why they should watch what you want to watch. So you really had to like sell that thing. Yeah. You had, a, it was the barter system too. It's that, Hey, you know, if we could watch uh, mash, Right. Uh, not once, but twice, the 630. And then again at the nine o'clock mark. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll pick up the garbage or I'll yeah. do whatever arbitrary chore that you want. So right. uh, I, I was I was into it, man. I was there uh, when my brother did live with us. When I went, uh, I, I would he actually moved up to Boston. Side OK. Of my time. Right. So uh, when he did live with us before that. I, it would be a barter and trade. And sometimes, man, it was fisticuffs. It was, oh, yeah. <laughs> it, okay, you're not going to let me do this. Then then I'm going to punch you. And then we're going to fight it out until somebody, you know, yeah. acquiesces. We're going to watch Mike Hammer or I'm going to get knocked out. <laughs> Dude, but we're going to watch The Master. And yes. I'm going to do a, a few karate moves. Shurikens. Then, yeah, I'm going to get you, man. Smoke bomb. <laughs> yes. He just disappeared. <laughs> I don't know where he went. That's it's great. crazy. Uh, so what did you do on Sunday? Sunday. Uh, I am a history buff and not only am I a history buff, uh, uh, specifically world war II. My grandfather was in world war II when I was growing up would tell me a bunch of crazy stories about being in the Navy during world war II. And, uh, that night I watched the world at war documentary. And, uh, that at that time, you know, you, you could get anything that you could get, uh, for me, that had you know World War II or Korea, uh, I I was there for it, man. And uh, to the point of telling you how much I was a buff that for my 13th birthday I had a World War II encyclopedia set, it was 22 volumes of World War II, both fronts. The Time Life was that the Time Life series? I don't know what it was. I, don't <laughs> I, I just remember it being everything and anything that had to do with World War II it was there. It's it's amazing. So the the world at war, which I've I've talked about a bunch in the show, weirdly because it's so well done and it still holds up. And World War II prior to that was all we had were newsreels and, and propaganda stuff. You yeah. had you know that the government made, um, which is why Vietnam was so crazy because you had unedited footage of like horrors every night. Oh, yeah. But the world the world at war was kind of the first thing that i know of that sort of approached world war ii in a very true documentary way there was yeah. zero propaganda there um or if there was they were teaching you about propaganda <laughs> it was like yeah. um but they even you know it, it's the first time i remember seeing the japanese interviewed talking about hiroshima and and you know the other side getting interviewed and presented in a thing and it was really eye-opening and this one is a really great episode as well. I think there's 10 episodes of the world at war. I might be wrong, but this is about Britain trying to develop an atomic bomb. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. Think about that for a second. Been, you know, we might have a English flag flying over the United States currently. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It would, it's just nuts. Like I always, um, you know, the bat story about Japan, the, the pre bomb plan they had. Well, where they were letting all the bats go for the, the sonar. Is that what it was? They had. So I guess bats at dawn, they inherently find uh, cover in homes like under eaves and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they had fitted all these bats with basically little time release napalm bombs. And the plan was we release these thousands of bats right before dawn. They go into all the houses and then burn all the houses down. <laughs> That was the plan before the able, and someone was like, "Guys, I got a better idea. Let yeah, let the bats go." Yeah, we're we're to split this atom real yeah. quick. Hold on, hold my beer. Uh, we're just gonna change humanity for all time. Forget about the bats. Um, yeah, but World of War really holds up. I it's uh it, it's really great, and and even in light of like, you know, the classic A and E was always the World War Hitler Channel. Yeah. Um, it's still really good. Um, and and you can see all those really easily now. Yeah, it, it's pretty it's pretty wild for me because. That was the first time that I saw, you know, what not, and you mentioned it, but it, it's the first time that I saw what war was without it being filtered through a lens of heroism mm -hmm. and, and 
when you know when there's somebody uh, from the U.S. military hovering over a bunker and blasting it with a flamethrower and dudes that are coming out the other side on fire. Like that was blowing my mind. Man. Yeah. But I, get, I was like, what is this? And it, it it's not funny, but at the same time, it, it's funny that things like that is what framed me liking punk rock more that it wasn't about the U S government always being right. It wasn't about authority always being right. And even though they came out, in the winning side, and uh, it what it didn't mean that it was because they were right, right? Right. So, uh, it, it things like that, and learning about uh, World War II and seeing it, it, it really tipped the scales into kind of questioning authority mm -hmm. and finding punk rock music at that time, and and being able to understand what war was prior, and knowing about like some of the horrors from my grandfather. Uh, it, it really tipped the scales. Yeah, it's it, we also were inundated uh, in pop culture in the 80s with with Vietnam vets like they would pop up in everything. Yeah, and, you know, with the exception of Magnum, who was like a cool Vietnam vet that wasn't although he was kind of haunted a little bit, um, yeah, which, just, which shows you how much it was in everything. But it really hammered home how horrific that war was and how completely damaged all the people who went there were, which was a brand new way to present war in mainstream pop culture. And same thing. It, it made me go that that's fucked up. Like, why, what are we doing? Yeah. Um, in, in a way that wasn't, I, I was so like, uh, like viscerally rejected hippie stuff. Like for some, oh. I was like, Ugh. um, even though ultimately they had the same idea, but it was a way to present that anti-war stuff without it being all like peace and love. It was kind of like, this is horrific. Like well, get yeah. mad. Yeah. Even the peace and love stuff had, it's like sort of dark side, especially, you know, it's like, the later side of it, right? Like you, you had, you know, it's drug abuse and a lot of like other sort of psychological craziness that yeah. went on with Manson. like that. <laughs> well, I mean, even, even, you know, take uh, Manson rode that wave though. Right. It's like when you have a ton of wreckage on the street, it's easy picking to like kind of go through if you were a master manipulator, like Charles Manson was right. So yeah. charismatic uh, and it, it, it's pretty wild, but I, I think again, go back world at war. It's it's, it would have been on a Sunday before school. It would have been a must. Yeah. Yeah. Cause Sunday's always the saddest night of the week. Cause you're like, Oh Jesus, I gotta go to school. So you might as well watch something really heavy. <laughs> you got the Sunday scary, man. You don't know what Monday school's going to bring. You don't know anything. So there it is. I still get them and I'm in my forties. Uh, I haven't been to school in decades. Uh, is that all you did Sunday night? Anything else? No, that that would be it, man. That yeah, was that's a, a good hour, night. That was two hour. That was a two hour block, man. Uh, like, and I, I rode that wave. Like I said, by ten o'clock, I'd be I'd be done. I'd be in my room, headphones on, listening to records. Uh, you need some time to to cool down after that too before you go to sleep. You need to you need some silence, you know, between you know my mom and dad talking through the whole the whole show. Uh, I need some silence and be be with my music and be with myself. So. Yes. Um, right. Have you ever seen the 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 big red one? Of course. Oh, I love that movie. That's great. That's it. Never comes up. Like it never. People talk in war movies. Like I rarely ever hear people name check it, and I love that. I mean, Fuller's just amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, for for war movies, that was that was a good one for me, you know. Like, it's not like the Dirty Dozen. Like, isn't this fun? It's not like Ocean's Eleven War. It's kind of like, yeah, this is this is pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, not Johnny, get your gun, bad. <laughs> pretty bad. <laughs> uh, Monday, what'd you do? Monday, uh, I mash into Three's Company. <laughs> That's a, an odd transition, but it was what and, we had. And then, and then into TV's bloopers and practical jokes. This is a good one too. Uh, we get a joke played on Mr. T, <laughs> 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 and a practical joke played on Adrian Zamed. <laughs> wow, that's great. That's of great. TJ Hooker and Bachelor Party fame. Um, John Cleese is in this one as well. Um, with, with doing commercials. Um. It's so crazy when I try to explain to younger people how exciting bloopers was to us. Cause you just didn't 
see that stuff. No, I mean, and it, it's similar now. It's like you want to go and Instagram is full of it and Facebook and YouTube or people are again hitting the balls by the, the, you know, the model train and whatever. Right. And when you saw that, you're like, I can't even believe that this is like happening. Like, how did someone film this? And it's like the dad is consistently the foil and so much of that. Right. It's like the dad is walking out and slips on the thing The dad, you know, yeah. it adds the other thing and gets burned in the face. Like people are, people are going to the hospital with like major to slightly, uh, not so major uh, injuries <laughs> on these things. And people are like in the audience, he would like pan to the audience and it's <laughs> like oh, yeah. full, full belly laugh, open mouth, like, you know, losing it. And uh, yeah, I was, I, I was, I was on the couch laughing just as much. Still would be today. Yeah. Um, this is uh, the, the mash episode is a, is a really heavy one. Cause this is from the later seasons of mash when it was like, kind of not even a comedy anymore <laughs> uh, it, it was it, it ceased to be comedy and it was all about uh you know like a, a psycho I, I would call it like a psychological like warfare uh, yeah. tv show where you know you're talking about uh you have guys that are making uh you know sort of a uh, one-liner jokes being risked deep into uh wounded uh soldiers right and yeah have everything in between you have you know the craziest you know all of a sudden this weird prisoner of war guy like shows up and is locked and it's uh you have one guy who's addicted to sex and a sex addict and an alcoholic and dude like you start to go on and there was no anchor at all right and they, no. they brought the one anchor in for a little bit and then he became like loose cannon too with hawkeye so yeah. uh at a certain point, it was just a a a show of desperation, man. And you needed Three's Company yeah. after Mash. You needed to have that. If not, man, like you, you would be sitting there going, "This is crazy." I I used to torture myself by watching in Channel Nine, right uh, in Jersey. I used to watch Mash after the eleven o'clock news. And they had double one, so it was eleven thirty. And it was at midnight, it was MASH. And an hour of MASH right before bed was the worst. Ooh, was the yeah. Worst, worst. Yeah. I mean, that finale still haunts me that it was a baby thing. Like, Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, like, I, I'm chucking this chicken, but guess what? It's not a chicken, it's a baby. Oh, Ooh. I forgot. No, that woman actually smothered her own child. <laughs> like, yeah. what? Dude, it's so, it so wild. Uh, in the three's company that I, so uh, the mash says a legacy of war an abandoned infant of Korean and American blood. And then immediately oh, after that three's company is Jack's cookie recipe wins in a contest, but the judges are expected to award the $10,000 to quote unquote grandma tripper. <laughs> <laughs> so jack's got I, I don't i don't know for sure but i'm gonna say jack's probably gonna dress up like an old lady i'm just saying that might happen you know there there was a a huge tidal wave of men dressing like women oh, like, yes. and so there, there it is bosom buddies was on uh, a year before this which that was yeah. the whole concept of that show <laughs> yeah it was it was the, the whole thing tom hanks though too that was the jump off for tom hanks I um I had Julia Duffy on who was on New Heart and a bunch of other stuff and Julia's great. And she said that um when Peter Scolari got hired on New Heart, they're doing their first table read, and Bob Newhart, just to fuck with them real loud, turns to the producer and goes, I wanted the other guy from Bosom Buddies. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, what? no, and he's like, I'm just kidding. That's <laughs> like, which is fantastic. Uh anything else on Monday? Again, like that would be MASH, Three's Company. TV's bloopers and practical jokes that were called 10 o'clock, man. Like that was the, that, again, that was the call. It was by 10 o'clock. I'm, I'm unplugged listening to kiss alive to <laughs> Ramones records, you know, something um, to really calm yourself down to go to sleep. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, I had, I had a, uh, a window that you could, I could pop the screen out. Right. And, and lift it up. I used to hang halfway out. I used to, <laughs> to smoke a pinner joint and, and get a little high. And my next door neighbor, old, like crazy old lady, we used to be in eye contact all the time. I'm like getting high. I have the headphones on. She's trying to wave at me. I'm just like, <laughs> thing and just go Perfect. for it. It's perfection. Yeah. Per per did you, perfect Monday night. Did you have a bedtime or was that like a self-imposed bedtime? 
that uh, my bedtime. Uh, okay, here it is. On uh, at fifteen uh, during the weekday, it was eight o'clock. So if I was if I was doing whatever, I have to be home at eight, right? And then uh, on Friday night and Saturday night, uh, I had to be in at ten, but I had to be in bed by midnight. And that's that's fairly that's fairly generous. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. I, most kids, I'm like that. That that seems reasonable. That seems like yeah, good was, parenting. <laughs> my, my my parents were reasonable, right? And uh, it wasn't until I hit sixteen where it was no holds barred. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. It was, it was there. I uh I, I had no bedtime, and and in hindsight. I, I'm kind of like, oh, it would have been nice if you guys parented a little bit. Um, but actually this year, 85 is, uh, you know, flipping through the channels on MTV. I've told the story before, but I saw the young ones and saw the damned. And I wow. was like, I don't know what this is. But this is everything I love in life. Now this is, this is everything yeah. <laughs> just flipping around. Cause I couldn't sleep for me. Th- that moment was my brother. Right. And we were watching the uncle Floyd show. Yes. Which was New Jersey specific local, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was on uh, like a UHF with channel 68, right? Uh, no cable. Uh, and I remember sitting there and the Ramones came on and played live. And my brother goes, that's the fucking Ramones. And I go, I don't know what the fuck that is. And he goes, it's fucking awesome. And I go, <laughs> I go yeah, yeah it, it is. is fucking awesome <laughs> and and then we watched uh we watched rock and roll high school not not that far after that i think and that was my my seal that was the seal uh, yes hey the remotes are back you know i went from you know sort of the knack and and b-52s and things like that like kind of new wavy punk and then found the ramones and then found a slew of other stuff and then got harder got angrier you know, as time went on, mm-hmm. as we do as teenagers, did you see the? Rem- I imagine you saw him live in New York before. Oh, right? Ramones, yeah, so many times. I only saw them once, and it's like, and it was at Lollapalooza of all okay. things, um, which I was like, you know, I- I'm glad I got to see him, but they they almost never played Boston because. They couldn't draw here for some weird reason. Weird. I guess it was New York was so close. I don't know. It was very strange. Well, again, the, people probably know this, but they're, you know, a club band, even at the height of their fame in America, and they're doing arenas in South America. <laughs> like they're yeah, massive they, other places. You know, they were, they were doing, you know, uh, come down for a festival in Rio or Sao Paulo and be 90,000 people, 100,000 yeah. people. It's like, it's crazy. They're playing a 400 person club in America. And, I, in, and, the, and the crazy height of it for me, I, I was seeing them in like a, like a, a 1200 seat club and it was sold out. Right. Yeah. So uh, even down in Florida, when I moved down to Florida years later, uh, they were playing like Cuban club and Cuban club was uh, you know, 1100 people. And that was sold out. And it was so weird though, because you had punkers there and then you have like kind of older rockers there. And then for some, I have no idea why, but Florida skinheads loved the Ramones and they would show up and beat each other up and beat people up and stab someone in the leg and of course. Riot, riot afterwards and do all the other things that, that had to happen. I guess what else are Florida skinheads going to go see? I don't know. I, you know what, Florida skinheads, uh, they were, they would show up, but they would get angry and they'd get kicked out, right? Yeah. But uh, I remember seeing uh, the Rollins band in Florida, and I remember being excited, going like Henry Rollins, this is this is it. And I remember uh, second song, Rollins is, you know, get, like kind of give the middle finger the and, around, yeah. and uh, he has a foot onto the. Uh, the the barrier right and the other foot on stage skinheads like nine of them around just pull them into the crowd and then everybody goes wild and then the show's over then it's done <laughs> then it's done yeah they, that's beat, up, they beat up henry Rollins. it was done after that that's it's always weird to me like because I, I saw Rollins at the route once and someone punched him in the balls <laughs> and i'm like why are you here like did yeah. you want to see there or you just want to come punch someone in the balls <laughs> like I remember going to see uh, King Diamond play. Oh, oh yeah! And uh, during the middle of Melissa, uh, someone grabbed his large boot and was pulling it off. Right, and he got so mad that the show was over at that time. It was just like 
uh, he you know snapped out of the character and then it was done. And the I old- never understood. You're going to spend you know at that time seventeen dollars or whatever it was, but it's still a lot of money. Uh, and you're going to like make the show end and early. It makes no sense. I mean, it's either drug people or just I don't know what the deal. Is. Like the only time I saw Bad Brains a number of times, and HR is legitimately has mental health issues. Uh, so you never knew what you were going to get. And the only time I ever saw a rock show end early, aside from the green day riot here in Boston in 94, uh, was bad brains. And like two or three songs in, he was convinced somebody spit on him, which I was up. No one did. And he took the mic stand and just bashed this girl in the face. And then we just left. And I was like, I, 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 this is insane. Like, that's insane. That, that, that sounds about right. Last yeah. time I saw Bad Brains play, HR came out with a helmet with a microphone that was taped to the helmet sideways, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. With a bulletproof vest on and a briefcase that was uh, handcuffed to his wrist. Okay. He that still came out and fucking kicked. Oh, it was probably amazing. Ass, <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. you know, he, he, was, he was at that point. I mean, Bad Brains, that's uh, my top in my top five Same. Uh, of punk rock bands. So just that when I when I heard Bad Brains, I went, "What is what? this? <laughs> what? What?" And man, like that was it for me. I was like, "I love Bad Brains." I remember like getting my first car, like sixteen, uh, down in Florida. Just just Bad Brains, just like <laughs> just speakers, just like crackling and like people oh, yeah. looking like what what noise are you listening to but fuck, i love i never love heard anything like that there's one of my favorite stories i think it's daryl told this story there's some there it's one of the documentary like punk attitude or one of those documentaries but speaking of skinheads and there hr is a smallish guy but uh dr no is like a he's a big dude yeah, he's no a bullshit. big dude and they're yeah. tough guys and he was saying that the first time they played england there were all these skinhead guys up front who were all throwing the N-word at them and all this stuff because 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 England didn't get black people till like the 70s and they were terrified of skinheads. And so he goes, guy calls me N-word, put my guitar down, got off stage, beat the fuck out of him, got back on stage, finished the song. The kid couldn't believe I got off stage. He's like, yeah. no and, one <laughs> a lot and and usually those people down in the crowd don't don't uh don't count on you getting off the stage. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's like, it's a TV show. He's not going to come down here. Yeah, uh, awesome. And then he did. Uh, so Tuesday night, what'd you do? Tuesday night, a team into who's the boss. What and, a double feature. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? Like a team for me was always brilliant just because like, it was like, you know, character driven. Essentially it was the same plot in every show. Mm-hmm. Shit's fucked up. The A team comes in, they fix it, then there's a resolution at the end. Witty fucking lasts a little bit, and then poof, credits, right? And but with that said, like A team, just cool motherfuckers, mm-hmm. right? And like doing kind of crazy shit. Like, I want to make a flame again. I want to make a flamethrower <laughs> out of this propane tank and this whatever. Like, let's do that. I want to like be whatever. And uh it was just a, a cool show, man, for me. It just if there was an equivalent to like punkers on TV for me, that was the A team. Like these guys like, don't give a fuck. Like they're on yeah. the edge, and you know they're they're outliers on everything. And that that was a at that time fifteen year old me. That was another like a, a, a must see, a must see. And again, for for a, a light show that was sort of aimed at kids, they're Vietnam veterans who are fugitive vigilantes yeah. <laughs> like that's kind of a heavy thing and one of my favorite things to oh first of all the rick james episode fantastic <laughs> uh and the boy george episode but um i'd love to go back and look now that i know how much george prepard and mr t hated each other and george prepard was a dick and a half and he famously whenever he'd meet somebody his line was he'd go hi i'm george prepard i'm not a nice man that's, That's how he introduced himself. And he was either told that was his show or he that show was greenlit originally as his show because he was the biggest star on that show. Yeah. 
And obviously it became the Mr. T show. You have Mr. T on your show. It's going to become the Mr. T yeah, show. Massive. Yeah. And he didn't, Papard was not happy with that. And it got really heated. Like they wouldn't even shoot scenes together. And I watching it now, it's really obvious. <laughs> They're oh, not in the same shot. They're and it's they had to shoot around it, and that whole thing is just crazy. Like the fact they were able to even make the show. You know, it, it for me uh, the thing that I always go back and and look. Uh, a team, zero casualties. Oh yeah, like people flipping over in jeeps, like landing on the head, like guns being shot, no blood, no one dead. No casualties. It and if is, there is, there is like a, some weird, like weird bandage and a, like a lip that's like cruising yes. by. Like, but, but nothing gnarly. And when you watch it, you're like, well, like that guy would have been dead. Like all those oh, people yeah. would have been like, why didn't they just throw a hand grenade? It would have been like, would have killed everybody in that van. Machine like, gun solved. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was all those, I mean, Knight Rider, all of them. It was like, they might as well have had the G.I. Joe cartoon lasers. Yeah. Like, zero, the- zero, zero body count on, on 18. Zero. Yeah. Uh, but who's the boss, however? Very high body count. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you also want to mention, just because you picked bloopers earlier, the rival blooper show, which was sort of the Hydrox to bloopers Oreo, was also on, and it was called Follow-Ups, Bleeps, and Blunders. <laughs> Imagine that. Who got, who got fired? Greenland fired over that name. Yes. Uh, and it never really, never really uh, took off. Uh, who's the boss is one of those shows. I watched every week, but I don't think I liked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was one of those things uh, where, again, it had all, all of, like kind of character driven stuff. And it was always the same thing. There was never like a, a move on. It was just a regurgitated same plot over and over mm-hmm. and over and over again. Right. So yep. kind of, you know, uh let it let it roll some one liners and some other stuff and I mean again. Mona's great, Catherine Hellman's great. We all had a crush on Alyssa Milano. Yeah. Like those two things. My I love too again, the one thing I enjoy watching on that show is the 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 main kid. I can't remember his name now. Um, but he was in Cujo and, and uh-huh. great actor. Um, but he, he he came out of the closet late in his teens, incredibly gay, which yeah. is but they were writing plots for him where like Tony was coaching him how to pick up chicks and stuff. And this kid's like an awkward teenager. It's clearly not. And I'm like, this is so weird. Yeah. Like every, like, why did you write this episode? You know, this is not right. Yeah. It, it's crazy. I, but again, go with, uh, who's the boss. It was again, like older person, like in that, like you know, older not, lady. Yeah. Not, not really kind of, you know, uh knowledgeable but sarcastic and disrespectful and like you know uh bossy no pun intended and and there it is yeah. uh Al- Alyssa milano like everybody like everybody's crush that i knew but mm-hmm. man she was in commando like, yeah you now right around that time or maybe before maybe after i don't know the timeline on it but uh that was awesome that was awesome oh yeah you know? yeah commando's a great a great movie to this day. If I ever see a blue van, I'm always like, what are you moving to Connecticut? <laughs> and, no, and and it's never a funny reference. No one ever gets it, but I, I, my brain makes I, me I, do it. I thank you for laughing. Um, so that's, that's what happens. Uh, anything else on Tuesday? Or are we on a Wednesday? No, we're on the Wednesday, man. 18 hour show. Who's the boss? Like, I think on that, I don't know if it was an hour, but it was definitely uh, maybe a double. During yeah, that time, it, was but... a, it was an evening ender right there. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. What'd you do on Wednesday? Fall Guy yep. and Dynasty. Oh, okay. All right. Fall Guy, I'm not surprised by. Dynasty uh, was a little thrown. You know what? You know, we're we're in midweek hump day, right? My my parents, uh, they were they that was one of, of the shows. There's no getting out of, of Dynasty. So we were there, you know, and uh I, I didn't part- particularly even like Fall Guy either. Uh, I thought it was okay. Uh, it was a uh, fill time. Uh, that was more like a, my father's show. And then dynasty was more like my mom's show. So uh, I, I would go back and, and look at dynasty again. And I would like kind of see what it is and, and kind of catch it. Uh, I don't think I would ever search out fall guy on purpose to, 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 yeah. to watch it again. It's not great. It's, it's sort of like, 
I had a real weird aversion to the Southern shows growing up here. It was just like, I don't understand this world. And Fall Guy sort of was on the cusp of that. And it always felt to me like half a Dukes of Hazzard. Like it was like Dukes of Hazzard, which is one guy. It was like, this isn't like, it's kind of a not all the way there Dukes of Hazzard. Yeah, I I agree. I agree with that. You know, again, like for me, it was, you know, right. You know, you're riding the couch and filling up time, but uh, Wednesday wasn't a very like it, looking through uh, the rest of the choices wasn't really a great night for TV, man. Like no. and this is when they were like backloading good TV shows Friday yep. night. Well, Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday early. Right. Yeah. So that was, that was it. I mean, everything else Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays was all bullshit. Like during that yeah. time. Yeah, it's uh, although uh, Fall Guy, along with Greatest American Hero and Miami Vice, all three songs charted top 10 hits theme songs. Well, uh, great theme songs, that's why. Great theme songs. And you guys covered a couple of theme songs, I think of their first record, right? Uh, you know, we did Dukes of Hazard, Laverne, Laverne and Shirley. Shirley. Yeah. And then uh, Three's Company, we did two, wasn't on the record. But then we also did uh, late, much later uh, a record called the TVEP. And that was everything in between, right? We did like even iCarly at that time, and <laughs> we did we did everything. And uh, the best thing that I it was all done on the fly too. Yeah. But the, the, my favorite thing about that release was that we put all the songs in a row, and I think you can still find it on YouTube. Put all the songs in a row, and then we started with like TV static. And in between the actual songs, we had channel changing and commercials <laughs> happening, right? Uh, but we we actually put in those shows and edited it. So you'd watch it for, it was, I think it was 14 minutes long. And it was just, all those shows would come in and then, you know, little bits of whatever. And it was like, <laughs> you're flipping the channels. And that was my favorite thing about it. Oh man. It's, I'll put a, I'll find that and put a link up for people. Um, because for, for kids, especially our first favorite song is almost always a TV theme song. Cause it's a song that we have access to and we know we can hear every week. Yeah. At, at that and the commercials that you would yeah. hear 30 times a day, you know, I don't want to grow up. I'm a toy kid. 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 And, then I'm yeah. and easy to do with a band. Cause I'm sure everyone knew the song immediately. And it's like, what, like, Oh, we all know this one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, there, there's just a lot of, a lot of wild like commercials that were so super catchy. And then, you know, you're, it's designed, you know, TV show theme songs were designed to lure you in and lock you in and anchor you in. Right. Like, it wasn't designed for anything else like moody. Like it wasn't until later that was like, Oh, here's TV shows. We're going to make it a little bit moody. But right. still the same end was to lock you in and, and draw you into a headspace, but a lost art. I mean, there are almost no theme songs anymore. Yeah, but, you know, if you go to like Nickelodeon where they're like part of the marketing plan is the theme song. Like, right. It's there. You know, Disney, Disney channel and things like that. Do you have an all time favorite TV theme song? Uh, you know what? I, I'm gonna go with Greatest American Hero would be one. would be one of my one of my faves. I think that after that, uh, the only TV theme song I wouldn't call it a fave, but it evokes the same thing even to this day is the theme song to Mash. As soon yeah. as it comes on, I get sad. Like, Suicide is painless. <laughs> this is the sad, this is the saddest song. Like, it is. Oh, uh, yeah, you hear it and it's this is this is terrible. This is I, I'm totally bummed. That and the taxi theme really like instantly. I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> oh, God, the, the taxi theme for such a happy show, man. Yeah. That theme song was just like, dude, this sucks, man. Sucks. That was on set and talk about like Sunday nights. That was like the Sunday scariest thing. Like uh, taxi would be on in Jersey, like it would be on Sunday night late, like kind of 10 30 to 11 or whatever. And man, it would be like, <laughs> Oh God, you're, you're hurting my heart. on yes. all of them, Well, that show, I mean, that show, which I appreciate it more as an adult is all about people not being who they want to be and having a, a, it's a night job in that case, but it, which, you know, anyone who goes into the arts in any way, you appreciate the sadness of that show where everyone's like, I'm a boxer, I'm an actor, I'm a musician, I'm this. And except for Alex is just like, I drive a cab. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which is the only I, I'm, one. I'm, I'm all these things, but I'm I'm just a taxi driver. Yeah, he's the only one who's being like honest with himself. Uh, Thursday, what'd you do? Thursday, Magnum PI, Simon and Simon, two shows. Oh. By the way, like when we started this, 
those are the two shows that I'm most ambivalent about where I'm like, <laughs> ah, ah, ah. and I look, I look again, Thursday, I look to see what was on. And that was, that was the, for me was the cream of the crop. These two Magnum PI. There was a moment where I went, <laughs> okay, cool. Like, you know, <laughs> this, this is all right. But then after that, like it got to be just like ridiculous. I was like, okay, I, I can't watch this anymore. It's done. Simon and Simon, like it started and you go, oh, it, it's this. And, and, but it, it just, it, it never, it, there was never any uh, uh, rubber on the road for it for me. I was just yeah. Like, hmm. It's like someone went, you like Magnum. What about a show with two of them? Yes. Two Magnums. And then you're like, no, it's actually half as good. I don't know how that works, but that's what happened. And Magnum, once you kind of get over the charm of Tom Selleck, which most of us do, you're like, yeah. eh. <laughs> like I don't really care. There was, about no, there was nothing there, man. Yeah. Like, for, for me, I, I thought, you know, uh, early on, it was like, oh, it's, you know, it's Hawaii and it's, you know, it's guy was laid back and he, you know, was witty and he has a, you know, but eh, eh. It, you know, again, but it never, it never had traction for me and it was never a super exciting uh, show where I went, yeah, like this is, this is a must see this. It just didn't have it for me, man. Despite, you know, I'm not saying that, that uh, Tom Selleck w- had, didn't have his like moments, other places just on that. Run show away. Thing, just like eh. run away is one of my favorite movies. <laughs> Oh, that's a good movie. I love that movie. And Michael Crichton, I think, directed it. Uh, easily Gene Simmons' best acting role. I love Gene Simmons. You know who else is in there, though, too? A oh, Kirstie Alley? No, Lee Ving from Fear. Lee Ving's in Runaway? Yeah, go look back for it. Oh, because he pops up in like the wildlife and the Penelope Spheris stuff, um, which is always weird when Lee Ving pops up and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Lee Ving, Vietnam sure. vet. <laughs> Really? Yeah. I know oh yeah. Like seriously shell shocked Vietnam vet too. He's he, uh, yeah. That's <laughs> Which awesome. Makes sense. When you look back at the fear stuff, such so as the early fear stuff, uh, I'm like, Oh yeah, this guy saw some shit. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I, again, we're talking about like, you know, punk rock, you know, fear fears in, in my top five too. You know? Yeah. Oh yeah. I, uh, who was it? The SNL they did, which is infamous because all the DC um, kids went up and you can see Ian McKay and Henry Rollins is there in the crowd as well. Um, but Lee Ving apparently completely lost his shit at <laughs> Donald Pleasance because Donald Pleasance was the host in that episode and he couldn't deal with the fact that Donald Pleasance, who's an English gentleman, uh, pronounced the word fear as fear. <laughs> and so Lee Ving was like, it's fucking fear. But like, he like lost his mind because Donald Pleasance wouldn't pronounce fear the way he wanted him to. That's great right there, man. Which is amazing. Uh, so final night of the week, Friday night, what'd you do? I went for Webster. Okay. And I went for Benson. Benson is great. Still holds up to this day. Agreed. I think it's, it's, it's there, man. You know, it, it, it's, uh, Benson to me, it was always like, you know, a, a smarter show, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Webster was just good for bullshit, right? Like, you know, I I've had Emmanuel Lewis on this show, and uh, the crate. First of all, he told me that the which I don't know how I didn't notice this. The kitchen from Webster is in the Golden Child. That's great. <laughs> they did. They had to do pickups for the golden child. They needed a kitchen scene. And they just used the Webster set. And once he told me it's ridiculously obvious <laughs> and it's so weird. I'm like, why is there, why are they on Webster set all of a sudden? Uh, he also told me the craziest Michael Jackson story I ever heard, oh, uh, which was, he was very friendly with Michael Jackson and Brooke Shields. They all hung out all the time. And, uh, and actually Manuel Lewis, a Brooklyn kid. Um, and, Michael Jackson used to call call Manny up and ask if he could come over and do chores. So he would go over their house and like mow the lawn, do the dishes, do the laundry, because he just wanted to do like something normal. <laughs> so weird, man. <laughs> like, that is weird. You have Michael Jackson washing the dishes. Very strange. Uh, there's also a thing called the Comedy Factory, which is because we're in the summer here, I always feel to mention that they used to do this great thing where 
all the unsold pilots to make some money back. They would always burn them off in the summer under this kind of bullshit anthology thing, like Comedy Factory. It's a new half hour comedy every week all <laughs> summer. And so this one is a is an unsold pilot. This is uh, called Honey. <laughs> this sounds like the most made up sitcom. Honey, it's the mayor. <laughs> That's the name oh, of the really? show concerns the marital status, ex- marital strains experience by a hard nosed reporter played by Susan Hogan and her husband, Jeffrey Bowes, a speech writer for the mayor during an election year. <laughs> that sounds it's so, so weird, bad. Man. Well, honey, that it's the, terrible. honey, it's the mayor. Oh, no wonder that didn't get picked up. Uh, anything else that night? You know what? Uh, that, that would be the two that I would like kind of go with. Uh, Friday, Friday night was, you know, if I was home and then I'd go in again, like kick it. And, you know, if I was going to come back out, it would have been like later era, like after like the 10 o'clock news or the 11 yep. o'clock news, my parents would be, you know, uh, in bed and there'd be like, uh, on Friday nights and Saturday nights, both late night, like sort of like video shows, yep, and Friday night videos, and, late, yeah. late night, sort of like Mondo video. And then weird horror movies and weird cult classics yeah. and things like that. So night flight but, channel 11 always did oh, yeah. some cool night stuff. Flight was great, man. On USA. Yeah. Night flight changed my night flights where I heard about, like I saw another state of mind for the first time or yeah. like, you know, John waters interviews and like just uh church of the sub like all that stuff that became yeah. like a, a pillar of who I became. Yeah. <laughs> so fr- Friday night, if I was home, it would be for like late night vibes, right? It would be, you know, kind of wait till hold hold my time until the parents went to bed, and then and watch I, some Barney Miller reruns. I, I love Barney Miller. Uh, too, it, man. Like, my favorite sitcom, probably yeah. ever. So good. Uh, so that is the week. Is there anything you've been watching in lockdown, or like any comfort shows you revisited, or anything like that? You know what? I I, I didn't go back like for lockdown. I didn't go back to anything. Right? Like I kept on. I made a promise to myself. I'm like, if if we're in the, like sort of like the stasis that I'm going to just fill myself up with anything new, right? So there was no comfort shows. There was no nothing. It was, oh, like my friend, I heard this. Like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go check it out, you know? So I rode the, you know, the same stupid, like, uh, Tiger King. And I, yeah. I, I went, I allowed myself to say yes to everything. But what uh, I did, it was just, musically man like i i i dove in listened to so much music like went through all of my records i went through everything that i saved that i didn't listen to i went back again and went oh like this is the fear live record okay i'm gonna go listen to that and listen to it or whatever and it was more about like discovering anything new or stuff that i had on hold that i didn't go back to you know and i'm a big audio books person as well and just when i'm kind of lurking around and and doing whatever mindless shit i would have the audiobook on and and kind of detach from there but i didn't go back on it and sometimes uh i i would go back and check things out and while uh great american hero while the the theme song is great oh the show the show is the show is garbage it's garbage terrible yeah and uh, you know, the thing that, uh, if you go back to like a Saturday or a Sunday, there used to be a, uh, show. It wasn't a show. It was like a movie and it was horror movies, but it was called a uh, chiller. Yeah. Right? With and the hand, the, the hand chiller, yep. right. And, uh, that used to be like a must see thing. And then when USA started to become popular, after Saturday school, nightmares, you know, it was that. And then it was a uh, Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoons. They had martial arts movies. So like yep. that was a must that wrestling went, during USA. That was a must too. So commander uh, USA. Did you ever watch commander? USA? No, I never did. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's it, what you've described is like in the blue oyster cult song burning for you. <laughs> There's a lyric that always struck me as sort of like weirdly sad, but kind of amazing where it's like uh time to play B sides. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what you did. You'd use quarantine as your time to play B sides basically. Yeah, man. But yeah, you know, there's that like discovery process too, right. That 
on daily life. I'm a dad, you know, and I, I have a lot of other stuff that's going on, and especially on the creative front. So for me to go back and like dig through things that I just put on hold, it was the perfect time for that. And was there a few gems in there? Sure. It, was there a lot of bullshit? Absolutely, man. There was like a reason why it kind of <laughs> yeah. hung in, out in a, a pause scenario, right? But it's worth it for those gems. Like that's the the thing that. Yeah, for sure, man. I, I think that like I, I am a person that like floats between the past and the present and the future, right? I like. You know, I, I spent a lot of time on like looking back, whether that's like drawing inspiration for like lyrics or book stuff or, you know, or just general vibe. And, you know, I spent a lot of time because I'm a dad, like thinking about like future of what it is for yeah. my daughter and how things are going to go. And, you know, I, I kind of go between all three things, you know, past, present and future. So I like to revisit like moments and I like to revisit like, how I felt and the idea. And it was cool to like go back and look at this because I, I know who I was at that point, you know, yeah. and like, uh, I, and the feeling of it and, you know, thinking about, Oh yeah. Halloween when I was 15 was like this. And that was the last time that I was spent those holidays in New Jersey. Cause I left when I was 16 to go down to Florida. So it was all the same thing. It was the last year that I was in that house before I moved to Florida. Yeah. So, it's, it's great to look at these and see and know exactly where you were and what you yeah. were doing, which is such a weird thing to be able to do to pinpoint a specific half hour of your life. Yeah. And, and, and it's crazy to me because, you know, a lot of these shows that I had watched, you know, formed, you know, who I am now and how I think and, and who I became a little bit after that, then a little bit after that, then a little right. bit after that. Right. Which and, you don't think is the case at the time. <laughs> oh, no, no, not at all. You know, but each each one of these things, TV, like I came from uh, that time period where the, the TV was the, the babysitter, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you spend a lot of time with, with these characters and, and growing up and uh, weirdly enough, learning lessons and being able to you know, apply it to what you're doing and how you're feeling. And sometimes it was so flawed and laughable that you're yeah. like, come on, like that doesn't happen. But sometimes in the way of like mash and the way of like, you know, the world at war and, and even like crazy, like weird kind of funny shows, right. You start to learn about like, well, wh wh why is this? And, and how does that apply to me? And it's just yeah. weird, but very cool, man. Yeah, like I always say, the tw like the Twilight Zone made us all better people. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> like, I even agree. if we didn't I, I know what was doing that, you know. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what does that now, or like, or like a, a couple of years ago when all of a sudden all these politicians were like, "Oh yeah, I did blackface before." I was like, "What? What?" But I'm like, "You didn't watch that? Give me a break!" Where they told you that was wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you know, we all we all did better. And audiobooks. Uh, did you hear the two John Doe ones? No. Oh my God. There's two, uh, ones we're desperate and ones under the big black sun, all about the LA punk seventies and eighties scene. Each person wrote, wrote a different chapter and then reads their own chapter. It's like Jack Christian from TSOL, Jane Weedlin. Right. It's amazing. Those two books are great. Uh, highly recommend those. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you for doing this. <laughs> no, this was awesome, man. Thank you so much. There you go. That's Vinny. Great time talking to him. Uh, just great. Uh, also, I'll put up links to that Less Than Shake uh, TV EP, which is super fun. Uh, it's up on YouTube. If you want to check that out. Also, links to The Inevitables, to his new book, 619. Bunch of cool stuff. So uh, you, you, there's so many things you could do uh, to support Vinny and his uh, massive output of artistic uh, items. <laughs> or me. If you want to support me and my uh, less massive output of artistic items, you can do so on Patreon. Go to patreon.com backslash TV Guidance Counselor. 
give a buck, $200,000 a month, whatever you want. There's a couple different tiers. Let me know if there are any rewards you would like to see on there. I usually put up uh, bonus episodes. You get episodes early, some video stuff. I'm kind of just still experimenting with what people might want to see on there. Uh, also, if you go to T Public and search TV Guidance Counselor or just ask me for the link, we have merchandise on there. There's about 10 different shirt designs, but you can also get them on like tote bags and uh, phone cases and hoodies and I think sheets. If you want that, uh, if you know what, if you get sheets, send me a picture. I'd, I'm, I'd be curious to see that. Uh, or if you just want to get in touch with me, you can do so at TV guidance counselor at gmail.com or can at I can read.com. And you can request guests that you would like me to talk to on the show. And I will do my damnedest to get them on. I always take your suggestions and I always attempt to get them. Sometimes I get them. Sometimes I don't, but it's always nice to hear who you would like to hear on the show. And actually a lot of times I'll get a request and I'll go, Oh, I had them on the show. Uh, and then I'll send them a link because I've had like 500 episodes of the show because I'm insane uh and speaking of episodes of the show there'll be a brand new one next week so i hope to see you then for that brand new episode of tv guidance counselor yeah we're, we're gonna split this out real yeah. quick hold on hold my beer